Welcome back to MD 101, my little series on the basics of maladaptive daydreaming. Now for this part especially, I want to reiterate, I am not a mental health professional. We're going to talk about how to deal with maladaptive daydreaming anyway. Just keep in mind that this advice is coming from my fellow maladaptive daydreamer, not a clinician. Looks like we may... So you've discovered this term, maladaptive daydreaming, that describes this thing that you've been doing probably for a big chunk of your life, and you're not really sure what to do about it now. It kind of takes a minute for everything to, to set in. You know, you'll be noticing connections that you never noticed before. Maybe you never noticed that the pacing and the daydreaming were connected or that your love of music was actually deeply integrated into your fantasizing. Maybe you never noticed your tendency to isolate yourself, you know, whatever it is. Now that you know the term and you know a little bit about it, you're, just, you're, you're going to start noticing its impact on your life in a way that you maybe hadn't noticed before. And there's no reason, no reason to freak out. Don't freak out. You've been living with this a long time. You're not dead yet. You can sit with it for a second. But while you're doing that, research and document. So just look stuff up about it. Obviously, I'm a fan of the peer-reviewed kind of research, but you can also um, just look for other people's experiences and what they're saying about it. Obviously, take everything you hear with a grain of salt and keep in mind that nobody is going to experience this in the same way and that, you know, all the symptoms as we went over before are really a mixed bag. So one MD -er can look very different from another and it doesn't mean they aren't struggling with the same condition. There's also a fair amount of misinformation out there. So just, you know, if you hear something presented as a fact, check it. It might be right. It might be wrong. Like, just, just look it up. And a great resource for you to do that with is the ICMDR, the International Consortium for Maladaptive Daydreaming Research. They have a website that they collect um, links mostly to research. You look at their publications page and you'll see just, just about every every paper whose primary focus is maladaptive daydreaming listed there. There's quite a few at this point, you know, like, I mean, not as many as you're going to find for, for something like anxiety or OCD or anything, but, but there's a decent amount. As soon as I sit down, everybody needs to walk above my head. What was I saying? Yeah, there's a decent amount. So, you know, maybe, maybe just read through their abstracts first and, and then dive into the ones that seem, you know, pertinent to your experience or interesting or whatever. I don't know. I think you should read them all. I've read them all. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not like someone who understands statistics or, or like, you know, the, the ins and outs of science and research, but all the papers have, you know, like, um, a discussion and a conclusion section. So even though the method section can be a bit dense, you know, to read through, skip ahead, you know, at least for now, you can skip ahead. It's okay. It's okay to just read the conclusion and, you know, see the whole thing summed up. While you're doing this, just write your thoughts down. Diary, notebook, app, whatever. It doesn't matter. Even if you're not writing it down, just make like a mental note. Oh, that's connected. Oh, I noticed this. There's a lot of pathways to MD, and so there are a lot of ways of approaching it. So we're just going to go through some of the common advice that the ICMDR gives for addressing your maladaptive daydreaming. And again, this is common advice that should work for most maladaptive daydreamers, if you want something tailored specifically to you, you, you need to talk to your clinician. All we can do here is kind of give the broad strokes. So the first piece of advice is identify your triggers. Don't worry, we're not talking about doing anything with them yet, just identify them. So the biggest ones are music and movement. We talked about those in a previous video, I can't remember which one, but they're super, super common. And like we talked about in whichever video that was, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Music can act to trigger, maintain, or enhance. So that's one you can probably pretty easily identify right off the bat without even trying. And then, you know, you can look at it a little closer and see, like, what is its main function? Is its main function as a trigger, maintainer, or an enhancer? Lots of things can be triggers. You know, not, not just physical or external things. They can be internal, too. You know, bad thoughts. Maybe you use your maladaptive daydreaming to push away bad thoughts. Maybe you use it to ease boredom. Maybe you use it to self-soothe as, um, you know, just a, a general 
catch-all coping skill for whatever is going on in your life, or maybe it's for something specific uh, related to a specific event. Um, you know, about 25% of us have a history of trauma. It could be related to that. It, you know, just, just sort of look or notice what's going on with it. And I can hear you. I can hear you saying, but dimmer. I don't have any triggers. Everything's a trigger. I just do it all the time. It totally gets you. Me too. So with with a maladaptive daydreamer like that, where ever it's just going all the time, you can still kind of do this step. You can pick out the ones that are particularly strong, particularly strong. You know, there'll, there'll be a couple that rise to the surface as like you know, like like stronger ones. Or you can you can do it backwards. Don't matter where see what triggers you to be engaged in the world. In fact, I would recommend that for the first people too. <laughs> you know, go ahead and see what triggers you to to good productive things that you want to continue doing. Uh, but it, but especially for the I don't have any triggers crew, it's okay to it's okay to work backwards. You know, see what takes you out of it and work from there. And right now, right now you're still just in the information gathering phase. You don't have to do anything about any of these triggers. Just notice them underlying issues. So yes, we are talking about comorbid disorders here, but also anything else, just things that could be fueling the maladaptive daydreaming. You know, if you notice that one of your main trigger, for example, is stress, what's driving that stress? Yes, you could have an anxiety disorder, or maybe you just live a high stress life for some reason, or maybe that's just the current trigger. Maybe you're not usually a stressed out person, but now you are, and you you need something uh, to counterbalance that and the, the daydreaming took over. And that goes for anything, you know, um, if you notice that boredom is your trigger, is that because you're understimulated because of the circumstances surrounding you or because you have ADHD? You know, do you daydream because you're lonely? And is that loneliness because of a social anxiety or because of your circumstance? You see, what, you see where I'm going with this? Like, no matter what is underlying it, you're going to want to pick that apart a little bit too. So one of the advices that I personally give people, and I've seen other people say it to you, um, the only one really relevant to this would be Ellie Somer. I saw Ellie Somer talking about this in a video of his. It's to stop. Stop daydreaming. Just just for a minute. Don't freak out. Don't freak out. Just for a minute. For any set length of time. You know, give yourself a day, okay? I'm not going to daydream today. And pay attention to your body and what happens during that time. You don't need to last the entire day or three days or week or however long you set aside for yourself. The point of this little experiment is to fail. But in that time, you, you need to pay attention to your body and to your feelings and what is happening while you're not daydreaming. You know, what what surfaces? Do you feel depressed? Do you feel anxious? <laughs> you know, uh, take note of how strong maybe the cravings are and how how strong the triggers are, like how, how much effort do you need to put into resisting a trigger that pops up during this time? And they're, they're all just, just little clues, just little clues, clues, gather them all up, you know, jot them down, make a mental note, whatever, whatever you need to do, just gather information, track it. I mentioned it a few times in this video, you know, to, um, to jot it down, to make mental notes, you know, do whatever to keep track of all this new information that's coming in. I don't know about you, but I have a shit memory, so making mental notes isn't going to work for me. I need to write it down somewhere. Um, and it doesn't matter where. There are journals and things that you can get online. You don't need them. You know, all kinds of habit trackers and things. I'm actually going to do another video about those. But all you really need, you know, is a sheet of paper. So that that's simple. I, I, you can even go simpler than that. Chop feelings right off there if you want, you know, whatever. Just, oh, hard to see. Is it hard to see? Anyway, the point is you don't, you don't need to buy anything. You don't need to do anything. Find up the back of a bill you don't intend to pay or something, you know, just something to write on it. And just, you, you know, like 7 a.m., you know, I woke up and, and daydreamed for like two hours. Um, the trigger was waking. I just do it when I wake up. Feelings? I Sleepy? Just whatever, whatever you have found that you want to track for you. And, um, you know, other things, I mean, you might want to take note of the circumstances surrounding you, um, your overall mood, if you had any um, physical pain or anything like that. Um, track if you have had movements, you know, repetitive movements, if you're someone who moves, any anything that you 
or want it, wanting to track, but you know, just get the basics down. It doesn't have to be anything, anything fancy. And when you've taken a little bit of time to just stop and look at what you're doing, you're not, no judgment, no, like I need to cure this. You know, you're not even addressing it yet. You're not thinking about it. You're just noticing it. After you've taken a moment to do that, you can start to think about what you want to do with it. So just decide and you can change your mind. <laughs> you know, it's not one decision and stick to it. You can definitely change your mind about this, but you've, you've learned about MD. You've researched it a little bit. You've sat with your symptoms and kind of looked at them. Is it a problem? I don't know. It might not be, in which case you can just kind of not bother anymore. You know, I mean, you, you know that maladaptive daydreaming is a thing that exists now. You know it might be something you need to face in the future. If you notice that you start to, to have some problematic behaviors with it, you know, you can nip it in the bud. But if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. You don't have to be labeling yourself as disordered or addicted or as a maladaptive daydreamer. You just, you, you be an immersive daydreamer. You go do you. If it is a problem, you know, how big a problem is it? Is it just kind of, you know, oh, I, I just need to, to give myself a little extra self-care every once in a while, you know, when this kicks in? Or, or is it like, I really need to seek out professional help yesterday? And everything in between. And then kind of think to yourself, you know, what is your, your end goal? Goal might shift too, but just sort of, you know, start formulating an idea of what you want wellness to look like. Is that, you know, a life where you don't have these immersive fantasies at all? Is it one where you have achieved balance with them? You don't lock yourself into anything just yet. You kind of have an idea where you want to go and maybe some ideas of how you want to get there. Really need a new plan. So we're going to do medication right at the top just to get it over and done with and out of the way. There is no medication for maladaptive daydreaming. Maladaptive daydreaming really just hasn't been around long enough. There are no studies done on maladaptive daydreamers. Um, you know, trialing medications. You will find mention of medications in some of the papers. There's even a paper on, my God, what was the title? I can't remember what the title was. I'll find it and I'll put it in the in the description. Any Anyway, it was a study that asked self-identified maladaptive daydreamers who happened to also be taking medications or using recreational drugs to, uh, to self-report their experiences with if that had any effect on their daydreaming. They really didn't find much of anything. It'll be down in the description. You can look at it yourself. But that's that's just one paper. And these people weren't prescribed in the medications and things for their maladaptive daydreaming. In order to get a prescription for something, you need to be diagnosed with something. And maladaptive daydreaming isn't a diagnosis. If you have an underlying cause like anxiety, depression, OCD, ADHD, anything like that, your clinician can prescribe you something for that with the symptom of daydreaming in mind. If they know that that is something you want to address, you can talk about that with them. And while they are coming up with your treatment for it, you know, they can keep that in mind. And that's a symptom that you can go back and track. You can go back to them and be like, okay, this, this, it worked really well for this symptom, but it did this with the fantasizing symptom. And that's, that's a, a big concern for me. You know, just keep an open dialogue with whoever is prescribing you these medications because it's a it's a whole process. It's a whole process finding sort of the right tail for you. A lot of people will try um, to self-medicate with over-the-counter drugs or with recreational drug use. There's really not that much to say about that. I mean, if you are deficient in something, you can take supplements to help with that. And, you know, if it's a physical problem like that, it might help with the daydreaming. I myself uh, take melatonin. I don't sleep well and the melatonin helps me. And if I'm more well rested, you know, I, I have more control of myself and I won't daydream as much the next day, but that's just for me. You know, it, it, it might not work for a lot of other people, especially if sleeping isn't one of their big problems. And for recreational drug use, I, you know, just be careful with it because what we don't want to see happen is someone trying to self-medicate with whatever substance, legal or otherwise, doesn't matter. You know, you can still hurt yourself by overindulging in this other thing to take care of this other thing that you have going on and you do not want to swap one bad coping skill for another. So just keep that in mind when you are medicating yourself in any way. 
And for the love of God, don't take anything dangerous or creepy. All right. Watch out for like grifters and hucksters and shit who sell you sawdust and call it a supplement. It happens all the time. Everybody is going to promise you a cure and they're all full of bullshit. I really want to put that out there. Anyone who tells you that they know the cure for maladaptive daydreaming is someone you should not listen to. And I'm not talking about the little comments, like the little comments on the subreddit, like, oh, this cured me. You know, okay, fine. That's their personal experience. But if if, if anybody, if, if anybody has, you know, something to sell you, walk the other way because they are lying. They are lying to you. And I'm not saying that maladaptive daydreaming can't be cured. I am not saying that. I'm saying it's, it's, it's a process that is deeply individual that you can get with your current clinician or, you know, with any clinician out there should you choose to go the therapy route. And everybody who researches maladaptive daydreaming puts their research online for free. Go to the ICMDR and look up all those papers. Not a single one of them is hidden behind a paywall, I don't think. (laughs) So far, maladaptive daydreaming research has not hidden behind paywalls. Nobody is asking anybody for money. There is no official treatment protocol. It's just the researcher's best, most informed opinion on what can help. And their best, most informed opinion is, you know... um, the things we're going to talk about, you know, go to therapy, practice mindfulness, you know, avoid those triggers or or identify those triggers and underlying causes, you know, things like that. Things you might have to pay for, (laughs) but you will be paying a, you know, certified professional because you'll be going to therapy, not some guy online who says he's cured hundreds of people. He's just a liar or she not talking about anyone in particular. That was a bit longer of a rant than I meant it to be, but I really want you to take that to heart. There is no magic bullet and there's nobody who can cure you except you. And you can do it. I know it sounds really overwhelming and I know a lot of you don't actually have access to clinicians, but you know, there's a few things we can get you started here with that that don't cost anything. Mindfulness is one of them, for example. You can Google that right now and find a ton of uh, of exercises and you know articles and guided meditations or whatever but mindfulness is very versatile you can integrate it into to any lifestyle you know if there's something you already like to do google that word with the word mindfulness exercise like i i'm something will probably pop up you know mindfulness exercise for long walks mindfulness exercise for brushing my teeth I looked up just the other day for somebody in the Discord. It was like mindfulness exercise for reciting the Quran. And things came up. Like mindfulness, you you can do a lot of stuff with it. Because it's really, it's just the act of being present. A lot of people have this view of meditation that you need to empty your mind. And that's that's not that's not what the goal is. Don't empty your mind. And it will be, it will be hard at first. It's a new habit that needs to be built and sort of integrated into your life, which is why, you know, I said at the beginning that, you know, look up something you already enjoy doing or something you do regularly um, and just add mindfulness to it, you know, so you can, you can get it kind of integrated with not too much trouble, but it, you know, it won't work at first. You won't really notice a difference or anything, not, not for a while, but, but just Just give it a good try. Just keep doing it and really read up on what mindfulness is. Because like I said before, you should not be trying to clear your mind. That's not what it is. Um, I can't give or don't want to give, you you know, um, a big, a big, huge, you know, thesis statement here on what mindfulness is. But it's basically, you know, you sort of ground yourself in the present and allow yourself to feel those thoughts. Those thoughts will come in. You are not clearing your mind. The thoughts come in. And you let them go without judgment and just move on to the next thought. They come, they go, you redirect yourself to whatever, you know, your point of focus is. If it's your breathing or your body or whatever it is, just, okay, had that thought, back to my breath. Okay, had that thought, back to my candle, whatever it is. So that's a good one. Um, Being present is the, I don't want to say opposite, but 
kind of. It's kind of the opposite of of fantasizing. It's instead of you're letting your mind go anywhere and fall down those rabbit holes, you um, you know, it'll fall down a rabbit hill for for a second. Rabbit hill? It really bothered me. I think I said hill. It'll fall down a rabbit hole for a second, but but you just you redirect it. And the more you practice, you've been practicing daydreaming for the better part of your life. You know, practicing presence. It's going to take a hot minute. You know, just give it, give it some time. Motivation. You're going to want to keep your motivation in mind. Maybe you don't know what it is yet. That's okay. It'll come to you. Now, this is actually attached to um, motivational interviewing, which is a thing that therapists and clinicians can do with you. It's, um, you know, sort of a tool in their toolbox and, and something that they will, they will guide you through. You can do it on your own, though. You can generate your own internal motivation without aid. And it will help you to to keep that keep that somewhere close to you where you can be reminded of it so that when you're laying in bed and you're like, <laughs> like, fuck it, why bother? You know, you can pull that little nugget out and be like, oh, yeah, that's why I bother. I still don't feel like getting up, but I guess maybe I could, you know, and in that way you kind of get through it. Now, you're going to want to make this um, a sort of a positive goal. This is this is not a place to disparage yourself. So the the example that we gave was, you know, you want your your motivational like statement that you make, the thing that you keep telling yourself, you know, you don't want to make it something like MD makes me a shitty friend, so I'm never going to do it again. That's not going to get you anywhere. That's going to lead to failure. You want to you want to make it something like um, I'm going to prioritize time with my friends. That is what is important to me. And this is another thing, motivational interviewing or generating an internal motivation, something you can Google without much trouble. There's all kinds of articles about it. And it's just, it's one of those things that can, you know, make it, make an impact. We're kind of going for, um, what, what's it, it's like called the 80-20 law, I think. I can't remember what it's actually called, but I'm sure you've heard of it. <laughs> so you can look it up. And it, it's basically, you know, like, um. 80% of your gains come from maybe 20% of your work. So if you know where to focus that, that 20%, you know, you don't have to work at 100% all the time. Am I explaining this right? Oh my God. I'm sorry if I'm explaining this poorly. The point is, if you can pinpoint, or maybe not even pinpoint, but just kind of get the general area, there are a few small things that you can do that will give you a noticeable amount of progress. Maybe not as much progress as you want. They certainly won't be a cure, but you can start to see, you know, that these things are possible. Finding an internal motivation. It might take a while for you to figure yourself out, especially if you know you're in the thick of it and you're just feeling really numb right now. But if you put some work into finding that, that will be beneficial to you in the long run and lead to noticeable progress eventually. Putting some practice into something like mindfulness. You probably won't see gains right away. You might think it's stupid and not doing anything, but the things that you practice grow stronger and what you have been practicing is fantasizing. So that's very strong and you haven't practiced much, um, you know, being present. It's unfairly weighted to one side. So it, it might take you a minute to get the hang of it, but these are things that can be learned that can help. Uh, what I want to quickly go over is urge surfing. So this is a mindfulness technique uh, for behavioral addictions. It came out of the University of Washington. Um, a psychologist there, I can't remember his name. Marriott, Marlett, Merlot, Mattel, something like that. So if you look this up, you, you will find a bunch of information on it. Don't worry, easily Googleable. We call it the sober technique, which stands for stop, observe breath, expand, respond. So you've identified your triggers, right? And you've decided that the, there's one you want to address and you feel it coming on. You can feel the craving. Maybe you already started daydreaming and you caught yourself. Okay. Now pull yourself out. Whatever you're doing, just stop and lean into that feeling. Observe it. Yep. What's it feel like? How strong is it? Where's it coming from? Breath. Focus your attention on your breath. Very common, uh, very common uh, point of focus in mindfulness. 
not the only one. You know, if there's something that works better for you, do it. Do whatever helps you. But uh, breath uh, is one you're going to have available to you at all times. And then you want to expand after you focus on your breath a little bit, sort of um, expand your uh, your um, thought process into the future. You know, up here, we observed, we were feeling with that craving, and then we stopped, and now we're expanding, like, okay, what happens if I give in to the craving? How am I going to feel? How am I going to feel later today? Because the answer to how I feel might be real damn good. But how are you going to feel later? You know, just keep expanding outward. And then respond. You know, you've taken yourself out of the autopilot that you're on. You've interrupted the process. You've looked at the craving and now you respond. Maybe the way you respond is to give in. Hopefully not. You know, if you're moving towards wellness, uh, you know, eventually your responses will be like, okay, I'm going to carry on with the task that I was doing when this interrupted me. And you can read all about urge surfing, you know, on the internet. Like I said, mindfulness-based, which is something that's already recommended for maladaptive daydreaming. Um, maladaptive daydreaming is believed to be, you know, a behavioral addiction. A lot of people experience it as a behavioral addiction. So this might be particularly helpful to those people. And the last one I want to talk about is journaling. We already talked about this a lot because, um, you know, the whole beginning of this section was about how you should track what you're feeling and how much you're daydreaming and your symptoms and, and all that, and really, you know, take note of all those things. Um, so we've already talked a lot about this, but there's still a little bit more to say about it because researchers had maladaptive daydreamers log their daydreaming experience. You know, just like I showed you before, they had a little sheet thing for them to fill out. I am so sorry about that noise out there. Anyway, they had, um, they had sheets, they had time sheets and things for a for the uh, maladaptive daydreamers to fill out with, you know, little headings and stuff of things that they wanted to track for the study. And then something kind of weird happened. A bunch of the participants of the study told them that the journaling stopped their maladaptive daydreaming or reduced it. And that was it. Taking nothing else into account. Logging their maladaptive daydreaming helped to reduce it. I guess because it made them more aware of what they were doing. It interrupted, you know, that little autopilot thing. Because when they started daydreaming, they're like, oh, yeah, I got to write this down. Um, it just it just made them more aware. And, and, and it had a positive impact on them going forward. So I wanted I wanted to say that journaling, it's not just handy for figuring your stuff out. It is a reduction technique in and of its own. Also. I wanted to say, if you're somebody who's going to be following the advice of this video and, you know, you start doing what we said at the beginning and start taking, making note of your symptoms and stuff, remember that. Expect that your maladaptive daydreaming might not behave in the way that it normally does. Because this, for some people, is a reduction te technique on its own, you might see a change in your daydreaming habits just by paying more attention to them. It's okay. Don't freak out. You know, when you get to the to the part where you want to decide what to do when you're taking stock of everything and uh, wondering how you should go forward, if you decide that you um, are not a maladaptive daydreamer, that, you know what, actually, uh, I think this is a positive influence on my life and there's nothing I want to do to address it. That's fine. Just stop tracking it and, and everything should return to normal. You know, this isn't going to... Uh, this isn't going to affect you forever. It's not going to steal your daydreaming away for forever. So you can still track it and you'll notice a disruption, but you, you don't have to be afraid of that disruption. That's all I wanted to say. Just know that it will come up, okay? But don't be scared of it. And that's, um, that's the last thing I wanted to cover in this, uh, in this piece. And actually, this was kind of the last piece that I um, had intended on doing, but there's, there's just, there's so much to cover with maladaptive daydreaming. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really qualified to sit here and um, professionally dissect, you know, studies and really talk about the nitty gritty of those kind of things. But if you have um, an idea for something that's that would help you or, or help other maladaptive daydreamers that can be covered, you know, in one of these little MD 101 videos, then do let me know in the comments because I, I can I can do more of these if people are interested in seeing them. But I've I've covered uh, the things that I think are the main things I wanted to get to. But if there's other things that I really should have covered, let me know. And that is it. Maybe, probably, unless people say that there's other stuff I should cover. Uh, in which case, I'll see you eventually.